Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the United District Podcast. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by Sammy Mockbell, football correspondent for the Daily Mail. Sammy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. No, it's, it's great to have you on and obviously we're going through unprecedented times in personal life, obviously heavily affected f- football as well. Uh, how, how are you coping with lockdown yourself and how's it affected your work? Um, work-wise, you probably wouldn't believe me, given that there's no games and nothing to react to, really. But it's it's um, it's probably been one of the busiest periods I've encountered as as a um, as a sports as a, as a football reporter. Because mm. let's not forget that you know we've got nothing really to react to in terms of live sport, but we um, we still have to fill we still have to fill the pages. We still need we still need uh, content. We still need copy. But thank well, not thankfully, but. Um, it, it helps that there's, um, you know, that, that, that there is this drive to get the season back up and rightly or wrongly, of course, back up and running. Um, so a lot of the focus of our reporters are, are, are sort of based on that. There's a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, a lot of sort of plans being put into place um, just in case we, you know, the, 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 the game can return here. Mm. So um, there's still there's still a fair, a fair, fair lot of stuff to write about. So we're, 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 we've been kept busy. We've been kept busy. Yeah, well, that's, that's good to hear at least. Um, and actually the first question that, I, that I've got from Twitter ties into what you've just alluded to really. Um, it's a question from Liam who says, well, he's asking for the latest on the Premier League. He says that with two big leagues now effectively ending the season in in France and over in the Netherlands as well. How likely is it that the Premier League take the same action, or do they have a plan? Which I, I know you've wrote an article about this recently. Yeah, no, that there is a plan in place to, to, to if at all possible, uh, get the season up and running. There is a um, there's a Premier League shareholders meeting on Friday, where I think a lot of the plans and a lot of the proposals will be discussed and and potentially sort of ratified and rubber stamped. So we should know a lot more on Friday. Um, but there is, you know, there's 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 arguments, there's, you know, like any in, in all walks of life. There's there's there's, there's, there's you know counter arguments and arguments for. Mm. Um, it would be a massive boost, I think, to the country uh, for football to return. It's you know, it's the national sport. It's it's the it's a sport that uh, millions and millions and mi- millions of people uh, kind of you know you know follow on a daily basis, and it, and you know it's such a massive part of their lives. So for that to return to and to have that carrot uh, would certainly help at these uh, particularly at this point in time where where. Um, a lot of you know a lot of people are at home not knowing what not not, not knowing what the future holds, mm-hmm. and I think the return of football would would certainly so in, in an emotional sense uh, and a mental sense uh, help people get through or uh, you know a certain degree of people get through this emotional and difficult time. But then the, the, the counter the counter side of that argument is is you know is it's is it safe. Is it safe for, mm. for for football to return? Is it safe for the players? Is it safe for the for the staff? And, and let's not forget the players and the staff at football clubs. They're, they're not they're not performing seals. You know they have got families. They have mm. you know they've got their own health concerns. So uh, a lot of people will say, oh well, they you know they earn X amount of money a week, and you know they they they're, they're millionaires. They should go back, and you know, but. These, they are human beings, and they've got their own. As I say, they've got their own health concerns. They've got their own, uh, own health concerns of their families. Mm. So I certainly see it from both from 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 both points of view. I, I think there will be there is certainly going to be a, a a push and a will to get the season at, back up and running. Um, depending on obviously government good government advice and and whether they relax the the social distancing guidelines that are in place at the minute. Um, if they don't, then unfortunately or fortunately, I don't, I don't, I don't see the game returning. But um, for, as it stands at the moment, I can certainly see, at the very least, clubs returning to to, to group training and full training uh, within the next maybe ten ten days to two weeks. Mm. And then I think a lot of it then from, will, will depend on whether whether. You know, footballers and and staff of football clubs, whether they, you know, they will be tested regularly, as we know. Uh, whether whether they, they, they you know, that any positive tests occur, and I think if positive tests do occur at clubs and the players do fall down, are infected with the coronavirus, mm. then I think we, again we have to have a 
another look at the situation and you know as much as it might it might pain a lot of football fans across the country you know supporters of certain clubs I think a decision will probably have to be made to to curtail the season yeah yeah so do you think if say one 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 player uh, this is a, you know a very small level one player perhaps a youth player or, or staff at a club do you think one positive test could upend the, the entire project restart do you think something as small as as small as sort of one positive yeah. test could do that it would leave it it would leave it at risk for sure um mm. i'm not i'm not depending on the circumstances at the club and and but I think what, what what would happen is is obviously when we say group training, it, it won't be group training. I think cl- I think clubs will will break down their squads into maybe groups of three or four or five. Yeah. Um, so it, a lot of it would depend on uh, where if if they, whichever particular player was infected and, and and tested positive, who he'd come in contact with, and then whether they could nail down if, if if the whole squad needed to be tested, or if it was just those guys in his particular group that needed to be tested. But so that you know, if if a club does have one positive test, it would certainly put it in doubt. Mm. I'm not entirely sure whether it would it would kibosh and it would end the whole the whole operation. I think it would probably take more than one positive test, but it would certainly be it would certainly be a blow, and it would certainly f- throw it into doubt. Mm. And and when do you think is the is the sort of the cut off point? Because obviously we've, there's, there's got to be a new season at some point, and obviously resuming football any later than July surely is going to delay that. I'd agree. I'd agree with the July. Um, I thought, I, I, my understanding is I, I know of one club in the Premier League who are planning to return to group training on May the 11th. 11th. Mm. Uh, actually, I know of two clubs who are, are planning on tr- um, returning to play on May the 11th. So, if you back sort of you backtrack that, extrapolate that, you, you're looking at maybe mid m- mid June, yeah, um, the start of the season, and then yeah, if all if all goes according to plan. Uh, I think it is the mid-June point where I think the Premier League and the EFL want want the season to restart. But I think you're right. If it goes beyond that and it, and, and you start dragging into the first second week of July, uh, I can't see it because it, it you know it, the, as you say there is another season on the horizon, and mm. um, I think they will want to keep to those dates as much as they can, which then essentially means that the the uh, the players will have you no know, virtually no break in between the, the turnaround mm. of both seasons, which isn't ideal for, from a physiological point of view. Um, so there's a lot of unanswered questions. Um, uh, hopefully, the um, we'll have a lot of uh, well, more answers uh, on Friday when uh, after this meeting uh, of the Premier League shareholders, but where you know, this plan project restart as I, uh, as we've as we've dubbed it mm. will be will be discussed uh, at length yeah okay uh, I'm gonna ask you one more question on, on the topic uh, it's a bit of a tough one I know there's been debates raging on about it um, mm. if say if this this plan this project restart doesn't come to fruition obviously there's a lot of debate on whether how how should the league be decided should it go off current rankings you know UEFA coefficient I think has been mentioned mm. UEFA themselves uh, I think have they they told leagues to go off sporting merit, I believe, which is an incredibly vague and open uh, interpretation. What, what did you interpret that as? UEFA, you know, saying that leagues should be decided on on sporting merit. How do you think the leagues would be decided if I, they went off that? I, I think it's. I, I think the plan is to do, uh, and I haven't worked out the mathematics of in terms of the league table, but I think mm. they'll, what they what they'll look to implement is a a points per per game ratio. So they'll obviously go back. Uh, they'll do the maths and uh, see which you know um, extrapolate that for the rest of the games and 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 the, and the points will be tallied up um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a points per game ratio, which would obviously mean Liverpool would would still win the league. I I think that means the bottom three would still stay the same. Mm. What that means for the European places, uh, I haven't managed to work out. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. So where that would leave United in terms of uh, Champions League or Europa League qualification, uh, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I, I think Sheffield United have a game in hand, if I'm correct. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either, actually, what that would yeah. that would do. It, it, might, it might go against us, actually, I think, if anything, because of Sheffield United's game in hand. But... Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to see. Right, we'll we'll move on. Um, 
on to one of, you know, one of, if not the most talked about United player in the current squad, um, Paul Pogba. Uh, you wrote an article about Pogba on the 10th of March, suggesting that he'd, you know, perhaps done a U-turn, that, he'd, that a new contract was maybe on the horizon and that the the arrival and the performances of Bruno Fernandes had sort of had, had created this this change of mind for him. Do you think that that's still the case uh, at this current time and, and is Pogba now likely to sign a new, a new deal? Uh, whether he's likely... Uh, is totally dependent on, um, I suppose, what interest is is gauged in the summer. It is totally dependent on whether the United board and Oli look at the situation and say, right, you know, do we are we convinced that Paul Pogba is fully on board with 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 our operation, or do we think, you know, as as is speculation has obviously followed him around hasn't it really for the past 18 months mm. he's been linked away now, do we is this a player who is, who is 100% on board if that is the case and they are convinced by that then I can see them certainly activating the he's got a year a 12 month um, clause in his contract which allows the club to to activate that so that could that, that would extend his contract by a, a further year uh, and what that entails is if Next season, if you, we get an impression, or even towards the end of this season, if the season restarts, if they get, you know, if 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 Pogba's on the ball and he is performing in the way that we know that he can, um, there, you know, if that there would certainly be a wheel, in my opinion, and for my information, um, for United to ex- extend that. Now, I think the coronavirus and and the delay that that's caused has, has obviously changed change the the landscape of contract negotiations and renegotiations as per se uh because simply there just won't be scope to give players substantial pay rises mm. you just you couldn't you know even a club the size of united i don't think you could justify it in in, in the current climate now um i think he already earns close was it close to three hundred thousand yeah, pounds yeah. a week Pogba. now any contract re- renegotiation would obviously have to include a substantial pay rise. Now, you know, I, I, would United be would United be in a position? They'd certainly be in a position to do that, but you know, morally, ethically, when you know players up and down the up, well, all over the world are taking pay cuts, could they give a player you know a substantial pay rise? It's it's a question I, I I don't know the answer to, but it's certainly it's certainly a, a question that United will be asking themselves if if it comes to that moment. Mm. Do you not think he would also be asking for a pay rise if he was to move away? Though, do you not think the same sort of thing would apply to well yeah. the two clubs that are interested in him supposedly are Real Madrid and Juventus? Do you not think mm. that would work in a similar way if he was to ask ask for a you know a larger contract than he's currently got if well, he got to move away? One hundred percent, one hundred percent, and you know, and, and it works. It, you're, you're, that's definitely right. It works in both ways. You know, you, Real Madrid or Juventus would look at that situation and say, oh, "We'll have to pay a fee." I think we know. I think we know United would look to sort of recoup the money that they spent on him. So you're looking at, you know, eighty million plus yeah. <laughs> for, a, for for a transfer fee, uh, and then you're looking at giving him a, another so you know you're looking at three three hundred and fifty grand maybe four hundred grand a week now in in the current financial climate uh, I find it difficult to believe that a club would um, would set aside those sort of finances as much as a Real Madrid might want a Paul Pogba in their in their squad or Juventus mm. might want a Paul Pogba in their squad but can you you know financially can you justify it um, I'm not sure at the moment you can uh, so there's a lot of it, it, it's 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 crazy how the obviously how this whole this whole scenario is is, is, is obviously changed the world per se like just in general but yeah. in terms of in, from a footballing sense uh, and the, and and particularly with the finances how it's how it's absolutely how it's absolutely sort of changed the lands the landscape of of what may or may not happen in the summer. You, you talk about the finances there um, mm. affecting a, a potential pulp deal. Obviously, the, the fee itself being a problem for, for other clubs. There's been talk of a swap deal with Juventus. I can't personally see that happening with United running as a sort of business. It'd have to be, it, you know, it'd have to be multiple players probably because there's only mm. I think a handful of Juventus players that would even cover 
you know, Pogba's fee player for player, and I don't think they'd want to get rid of those players. Do you think that, that a, you know, a part exchange deal or a swap deal is, is something that United would, would look into? Uh, I think swap deals are notoriously hard to agree. Um, mm. The one that I remember covering was um, uh, it was it was Sanchez, yeah, um, Sanchez, and obviously uh, Mkhitaryan. Mm. I remember, but I, I remember the reporting on that on that story and that and that and that transfer and the toing and froing going between Arsenal and Man United and trying to agree, you know, figures for a swap deal. You know, United. United valued Mkhitaryan you know, at one price. Arsenal valued him at a completely different price, you know. And it, it, that, it, historically, swap deals are just so hard to to negotiate and to agree. So to, and that's just for you know a straight swap between one player and another. Mm. To include, if you if you're trying to in, you know include two or three players in the same swap deal, I would I would suggest that would be nigh on impossible to yeah. um, to complete so I, I think you're right it would have to be a straight cash a straight cash deal um, to, to, to get to get Pogba out United this summer mm. I'm just wondering as you know you're not a Manchester United fan I think most of the people we've had on have been you know Manchester correspondents in and around the club mm. which you're a bit bit distanced from that um, just wondering as an outsider what is your view on, on the way Mina Raiola and Paul Pogba as a duo have, have conducted themselves over the mm. past sort of twelve to eighteen months, with, with this whole thing, what, what's your sort of opinion on on those those two and how they've handled it? I think it's well publicised, isn't it? That, uh, that you know, Mino, Mino's done, a, Mino has done a lot of talking on behalf of Paul Pogba. Mm. Um, my opinion of it is 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 Mino should probably let Paul Pogba do do the talking. Um, yeah. Rightly or right, rightly or wrongly, he hasn't. I think maybe we, I think we have actually maybe seen in the past few weeks that Mino's um, perhaps quietened down with regards to speaking about Paul Pogba. I don't know if that's a I don't know if that's a, a conversation that Mino and Paul have had. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, listen, it, it doesn't reflect it doesn't reflect necessarily well, and it certainly doesn't reflect well on you know on Mino. It doesn't reflect reflect well on the on the relationship that Mino and United have. And I just think, you know, in general, those kind of conversations and, and you know, those those uh, those feelings should be kept in house, should be kept private. And you know, in any walk of life, no one wants their dirty linen aired in 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 public. And Paul Pogba will be no different. And and, and I'm sure, I'm sure he would probably he, he may have probably regretted a lot of the things that, that Mino said on said on his behalf. But you know, let's not forget that Mino has been very loyal to Paul Pogba. Mino has, has, has you know, got him to got him to Juventus. He got him back to Man United. Mm. He's made him a very a very wealthy individual, or helped. You know, obviously Paul Pogba's talent speaks for itself, and he's the main instigator of that. But Mino has helped him, um, has helped him amass this fortune that, that you know that, that, that he has. So uh, I certainly think there will be a loyalty from Paul to Mino. But on the same token, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if Paul would have his head in his hands uh, sometimes when 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 Mino says the things that he does. Mm, yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll move on from potential outgoings with Pogba on to some potential incomings. Jack Grealish is a name that's been heavily mentioned. It was James Madison last year. Obviously, it's flipped a bit now. It seems as if mm. United do favour Jack Grealish. Am I right in saying that out of those two? I think so. I think so. I think. Uh, getting James Madison out of Leicester will be uh, a very difficult, uh, a very difficult task. Um, with Aston Villa going down, seemingly, um, I think getting Grealish out of at Villa Park would be would be uh, a far a far easier scenario for for United. They're very similar players, aren't they? Uh, yeah. They're both fantastic players. My understanding was before before the coronavirus delay. Uh, Jack Grealish would have got his would have got his first would have got his first England call up for the for for the games at the end of at the end of last month mm. and the start of that and the start of April uh, he would have he would have, I think I'm sure he would have played in one of those games to be given in his England debut mm. and then potentially from there you know gone on to be one of the hits of of Euro 2020 um, so there's massive potential there's massive potential in Jack Grealish uh, and the re- and I think obviously there's a reason that they would have. Gone for Grealish ahead of Madison is just be- is simply because 
um, getting him out of Villa would be it would be far easier than getting Madison out of Leicester. Leicester, uh, you know, as we know, uh, a very wealthy club. They're probably going to be in the in the Champions League next season anyway. Mm. So uh, they'll be under no pressure whatsoever to sell. Uh, whereas Villa, if they go down, no, they'll probably have to sell uh, their crown jewels. Uh, and obviously, Jack Grealish is there. Is there? Is a prized possession, and and I think if they do go down, he will he will uh, even if they don't go down, I I I can certainly see Grealish at uh, Old Trafford next season. Mm. He was obviously exposed um, around a month ago. I think it was now. I've sort of lost track of time, as I think we mm. all have. Uh, where he was he was exposed for um, flaunting government guidelines, wasn't he? he? Was he was shown to be well? It was his Range Rover, wasn't it, on the side of the road, and yeah. a bit of a mess, a bit a bit embarrassing for him. And some suggested that that might have affected United's stance on him. Do you think that could be the case? Do you think United could have changed their stance because of that? Um, it's not a very good look, is it? No. Uh, no. Put it that way, it's an awful look. And um, he he was criticised and I think he apologised and I think all the, I think the criticism was right and I think the apology was, was certainly the right thing to do. Um, whether it... Listen, I, I, Ollie would look at that, I'm sure Ollie Solskjaer would look at that and Ed Woodward would look at that. Is that, is that the kind of character that we... Is that the kind of character that we need at the at the football club? But mm. push comes to shove, I'm sure that a lot of the negotiations between United and Villa have already have already have already taken place. Um, and whether would United walk away from that now just because of that? Um, I'm not so sure. I'm mm. not so sure. I think that I think they're quite a way down the line with regards to that deal happening. And and you know as as bad as and and as regrettable as that that situation was uh, I don't think famous last words but I don't think it would impact on, on United's, in, United's interest yeah okay um, on to another young English talent uh, another well a bit, bit younger than Grealish um, heavily linked with Ollie's project is Jude Bellingham um, sus- suspected to be signing for the under 18s wouldn't go straight into the first team mm. um, but would cost quite a lot of cash for someone that would go mm. into the under 18s um Last we heard, it seems to be a bit of a 50-50 between United and Dortmund, someone suggested. Do you have any updates on, on that? And where do you think he's likely to end up come the end of, well, whenever the window is? I, oh, I would, if I was a betting man, I would, I, would, I would say he would probably end up at United just because, mm. just because he's, a, you know, he's a young Englishman. But listen, you know, we've seen with Jadon Sancho you know, going to Dortmund and he's blossomed and um, other youngsters, you know, uh, Harland's gone to gone to Dortmund and Blossom, and that and that is a club where it's proven that they will give youngsters an opportunity. Whereas you, um, you know at United, um, youngsters in particular have to wear, have to earn their corn, and they have to prove that they are they are worthy of of of, of being in the first team squad. Mm. Uh, but equally, when you were when you were a young Englishman. Uh, it, it, listen, and it might have changed. I think people have, you know, uh, uh, viewpoints have changed with time. But I think when you're a young Englishman and United come knocking, I, I, I think it would be very difficult, very difficult to turn that opportunity down. You know, as as, as tempting as a, as a move to to Dortmund and Germany playing in the Bundesliga sounds. You know, playing with some of the great players that they've got there. Uh, getting to United for me still rem- remains one of the peak, uh, one of the one of the peak goals and one of the peak scenarios for any for any young footballer. So uh, when that when that is within grasp, um, I think it, it takes a very very um, stern man and uh, to turn that to turn that down. Mm, you've alluded to something quite quite interesting there, which I'm actually going to go off on a tangent now and ask you something a bit different. Obviously, you you said there that you know the size of United is you know this very desirable thing, which I think we can all still agree is still there. But how how far away do you think it is from you know United you know not enjoying that much success? How far away do you think we are of United not being this big prospect and perhaps Liverpool you know mm. re- overtaking us again in that sense or? Mm. You know, even Manchester City possibly as a prospect. How far away do you think we are with a lack yeah. of success from from it's that? Good, it's a good question. It's a generational thing, isn't it? Like, you know, I grew up. I'm I'm 38. I, you know, I grew up Liverpool with a Liverpool were in the 80s with a you know were were the done with a 
the team to beat. Mm. And then, you know, the 90s came along and they were united, you know, under, under Sir Alex Ferguson, winning everything in sight. And then we had a period of dominance with Arsenal and uh, Chelsea came along. And now, obviously, Liverpool were, uh, sort of were back on back on top of the tree. Mm. Um the longer the long, you know the longer united go go on with uh, without winning trophies and without challenging um i think you know they become much less of an attractive proposition for uh for players qualify qualifying for the champions league is 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 paramount it's an, i work i work down in london and um cover arsenal a lot mm. and the the quality of player that they were able to attract when they were playing playing in the Champions League compared to now, mm. it's like trust me, it's like chalk and cheese. Yeah, uh, and it's it's imperative that you know football clubs the size of um, United qualify for the Champions League, not just because not just because of you know it's, it's the finances and it, and it's the competition to play in, but the level of exposure it gives you across Europe, you know, to be playing on a Tuesday and Wednesday night, everyone's watching you. Whereas, you know, if you're playing in Europa League on a Thursday, you can kind of take it or leave it, can't you? When you, yeah, yeah. when you, <laughs> when yeah. you're, yeah. But you know, and, and so that 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 whole carrot of 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 being a Champions League club is it will will be and is so important for for clubs to size the size of United to stay just to stay relevant, just to stay relevant. Mm. You know, Arsenal, you know. Yeah, almost half you know almost half forgotten about sometimes because they're not because I've been been out of the competition for so long um so you know in, you know in the answer to your question yeah listen the, the longer you stay in the in the doldrums per se the you know the the, the the bigger the bigger risk you have of of falling out of the limelight and for a you know for a club the size of United falling out of the limelight shouldn't be shouldn't really be an option mm-hmm um, just moving on, uh, I'm sure you've been waiting patiently for me to mention this name, Jaden Sancho. Um, obviously, the big name linked to United. We seem to have one a summer, one big saga. Last year it was Dabala, obviously now mm. uh, Sancho. Um, all been, it seems to be going on track, and then obviously the, the pandemic came into mm. its effects. Do you think that has affected anything to do with Sancho, or do you think he's still on course to go to United in the next window? I think the, I think the, I think the coronavirus changes changes a lot. Changed a lot of things, um, and we touched on it earlier. You know, can clubs, football clubs, uh, justify spending upwards of eighty million on a footballer when uh, Fred's chip, fish and chip shop round the corner has closed down? Mm. You know, can you can you you know? It, it's not the greatest of looks, is it? When when local businesses are, are struggling to survive, but you know this this global powerhouse in. Manchester United or whatever football club, you know, were going out and spending, spending, you know, I say eighty million, ninety million plus on footballers, mm. and, and and I certainly think it will, it will ha- play a factor in the judgment of of many a, a transfer policy uh, at, at all the clubs this summer. But I suppose at the be all and end all, it will be, you know, how much do you want? How much do you want the player? And I think we know that. United are pretty keen on taking on taking Jaden Sancho. We all know why. Yeah. You know he's a young English talent. He's you know he's a he put, he's the future of the England England football team. And um, even more so, I think United, if Pogba does go, would be on the lookout for a for a, a, essentially a poster boy, someone that they can hang their their commercial operations mm. off. You know they've got that in Pogba. They've got one of the most recognisable footballers on the planet. Uh, I'm not saying that Sancho is is as recognisable or as popular as, as Pogba, but he's certainly got that potential. Uh, so I think, on that sense as well, in that sense, it, it a, a move for Sancho certainly makes makes a lot of sense, certainly on the field and off the field as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to another big name that's been linked to United, a deal that seems now Im- impossible. Harry Kane um, was a, it was a light link, I must say. You know, some suggestion that he might be willing to. Look, look at taking on a new challenge. Mm. Edward would, you know, quotes from him saying that you know some big name signings might not be attainable with the um, financial situation, which we've obviously alluded mm. to. Um, do you think that that the pandemic has and and those Edward would comments has disposed of any potential Harry Kane move up to Manchester? 
I wouldn't say it, it, dis- it disposes of it. You know, I think if United, if United, you know, were serious about um, getting Harry Kane on board ahead of next season, I, you know, I, I would suggest that they, Ed Woodman, wouldn't go out in public and say, "Yeah, we think this, cap- we're capable of getting the deal done." I think that would be. Um, I think he's too shrewd to do that to mm. sort of to, to 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 speak publicly about um, a player that United would want. But of course, listen, if Harry Kane is, if they if United think Harry Kane is available, then they will undoubtedly be interested, and they would they I think they would make the, the relevant inquiries to ensure that if they are in a position to move and in, in, in a position to strike, that they will do. Um, but yeah, listen. I, from what I understand, uh, Tottenham would look. You're looking at 150, 200 million mm. for 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 um, for Harry Kane, even in this in today's climate. Um, I just I can't see I can't see a football club anywhere in the world committing those sort of finances when um, the budget. And, and, and the outlook of how football will look in the next two to three years is so uncertain. Um, I think this summer clubs will would prefer to take stock, maybe pull in a you know a few uh, a few deals that are less risky. Um, mm. I think they would I think they would rather do that than go and splurge two hundred million pound on a on a on a on a player as good as Harry Kane is, and I think that would certainly be a low risk. That would certainly be a low, a low risk signing, but you're probably guaranteeing yourself twenty five to thirty goals a season. Mm. But you know, in this climate, as we've as we as we've said, is you know, can you, you know, can you spend uh, two hundred million pound on a player? I would, I have serious doubts over the, the viability of of, of that of, of that move. Mm, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm going to talk purely, you know, a hypothetical here now. If, if they were mm. to agree a fee, which, is, as we've said, is you know extremely difficult to do now, um, do you think Kane would be interested in in the project that Solskjaer's building? Do you think it's something that that he is a very driven sort of individual as as he comes across as? Do you mm. think he'd be interested in, in coming to United in the current climate? Well, one hundred percent. I think mm. if that deal, I think if that deal was doable. Uh, I, I certainly think, and I, and I think I've written in the past that uh, I think Kane, Harry Kane, would be up for a move to United because um, before the before the this pandemic took grip of the country and uh, you know football stopped in its stopped in its tracks, I think United were starting to build up a little bit of a head of head of steam, weren't they? And it, it was starting yeah, to look yeah. exciting. Um, uh, so I certainly think. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt, really, that Kane would would be would be interested in it. It comes it comes to the, you know the, the the Bellingham situation as well. You know when when United come knocking, it, you know it takes it takes a real hard nosed individual to to turn that to turn that down. And I uh, you know I, I think Kane wouldn't be any different. I think he would see a lot of potential in that United squad if they can you know. But Fernandez has come in and been a breath of fresh air. Uh, who knows you know. Kane, the capture of Kane and signing Kane would, 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 would you know, would, would, would breathe fresh life into, into someone like Paul Pogba as well to, to know that he'd have a player, um, like, like Harry Kane to, you know, to, to, to connect off. That I think that would be a fantastic part. I think that would be a fantastic prospect. It would be great for, 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 for likes of um, Greenwood and Rashford to learn off someone like Harry Kane. Mm. Um, it ticks so many boxes, and and I think you know, and I I, I think Keane, Keane, I think Kane would 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 certainly recognise that. But again, it, you know, it comes down to whether United want to go gung ho and full pelt for for someone who's going to cost so much money. Mm. One last question, um, bit of a tough one. This I think uh, mm. I'd be interested to hear to hear your opinion on it. Um, you know, someone who, as I mentioned, you know, isn't a United fan. What, what do you think of of the project being put into place by Solskjaer and do you think he's the right man for the job? And and if so, how far off major success do you, do you think do you think we are? Major success, I would suggest that you're what? Well, I haven't got the table in front of me, but what you you know, thirty points is it or so away yeah, from yeah, yeah. A, 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 away from Liverpool? I would suggest that is a very big uh, bridge to gap, uh, which will take more than one transfer window. That you know that takes two or three transfer windows. So 
to get back to the very top of the um, the English football pyramid, you know, I think it will take two, two or three seasons at least mm. to get back uh, to get back to, to to the top and to the you know, summit of the Premier League. Is Ollie the right man? Uh, I'm always I always change my change my mind, and but and I think but the the problem that Ollie will have is while while uh, Mauricio Pochettino remains out of work. Uh, I think United fans and I just think you know football people in general to see that as the perfect job for someone like for someone like Pochettino who's you know had he did a great job at Southampton. Okay, he didn't win a trophy at um, at Tottenham, but he got very close on a number of occasions. Mm. And uh, they you know we, he the, the job that he did at. Uh, at Tottenham, no, but no, nobody can question it. it. Was you know he did he did fantastic work there, uh, mm. and I just always ask myself that question: Would um, would I be? Uh, I, I think I think having Pochettino at the helm at United at Old Trafford at the Theatre of Dreams with the squad that they've got already, and maybe adding one or two two more, uh, I can see I can see Pochettino. Uh, Turning United back into a into a full force in English football, but that's not to, listen. That's not to say that Ollie's doing a good job. Ollie's doing a good job. I think he's doing. Um, he, he has, uh, you know, if they qualify, if you if they manage to qualify for the Champions League this season, I think that's a that is that is success, and I think that is a step forward. But to get to get United back to the top of the tree in England and back to the top of the tree in Europe, uh, I'm not convinced that that Solskjaer is the man for that. Mm. I know it's not exactly linked um, to United, but you've just mentioned Pochettino, and he's someone that I think looms large around you know, mm. the entire fan base. We're constantly sort of mentioning him and drawing comparisons to him in Solskjaer. Um, what do you think of him potentially going to Newcastle? It's a bit of a strange one. It seems to have completely flipped on, flipped Newcastle on its head. This this whole mm. takeover. Do you think you know could could Pochettino be snatched from under the noses of United and go to Newcastle? Um, he certainly he's certainly in a strong position, isn't he? Because mm. I think that Newcastle would would jump at the chance to to appoint Pochettino as their as their new manager. He he would be um, he would be such a high profile get for for the club's prospective new owners. I'm sure they would throw money at that situation, so he would make him a very wealthy man. But as I'm sure United would. Uh, mm. And yeah, you know, it's an interesting scenario because I can't see I can't see um, I can't see United. Um, getting rid of of Solskjaer just yet. Listen, you know, I think a lot of that might might depend on whether you 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 get into the top four and can qualify for the Champions League. I think a lot of a lot of that uh, uh, in terms of who will who will be manager at the club next season will, will depend on will depend on Champions League qualification. But you know, with <laughs> with the prospect of with the prospect of Pochettino. Possibly going to going to Newcastle, or certainly being one of their targets. That that certainly probably poses a bit of a problem for Ed Woodward, given that one of his go-to men, surely one of his go-to men, if you know if Solskjaer isn't a success, mm. would be taken off the market. You're kind of asking yourself, well, should we, you know, should we move for him now? But um, I don't think I don't think United are, United are in that situation at the moment. I, I, from what I understand, they are they will persist with um, they will persist with Solskjaer until uh, until they are giving a scenario or given a scenario where they have to actually make a decision. I don't think we're quite I don't think we're quite there yet. Mm. Sammy, it's been a, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you know, thoroughly interesting insight. Uh, yeah, th- thanks for coming on. Uh, do you have any last words you want to say to, to anyone listening? Well, if, I just want to make sure that everyone you know stays safe, stay at home, and you know that's long for or look forward to the time football comes back. But equally, uh, we are I think we all we're all in the same boat. Though we only want football to come back when it's a hundred hundred percent safe to do so. It's been a pleasure, Sammy. Cheers. Thank you.